Hello and welcome to Securities Lending Live with PeerPoint, take three. Um, listen, everyone, I really appreciate you uh, if you're uh, joining us again, joining us for the first time, or have been waiting around for 20 minutes to see just what the heck I said we were going to be launching and haven't done yet. Uh, you are now part of live live streaming history because it's been uh, 18 minutes of silence. However, the good news is all of the panelists today have had a good run through of the first 15 minutes of the show. Uh, so apologies to everyone. We'll get straight to it. Um, the, this is all about normally securities lending, repo and collateral management. The difference this week is the issue that we're talking about is transparency. Transparency is fundamental to all markets. We've got some great um, speakers and panelists today with experience across a broad range of products, and we'll be looking into each of those. Transparency is one of my favorite rants or topics, depending on how you look at it. Uh, and, uh, and as you know, I rant about many things. Uh, the objective of these events is to be uh, live and give you the opportunity to ask you ask questions, give us comments, give us suggestions, uh, challenge the panelists. They are all professionals and love it. Uh, of course, this is not uh, professional investment advice. Do your research elsewhere. I'm not qualified. Uh, and even if my panelists are, they'll tell you you should get expertise and guidance elsewhere. So thanks for joining us. Um, it's better if you're watching live, but if you're not watching live and you're watching it on replay, we still respond to any comments or questions that you put into the chat. Now, when you put something in, there's sort of a 15 to 30 second delay before we can see it. So uh, we'll get to them as soon as we can. So first of all, where are you watching from? I'd love to uh, hear you say what you're actually doing. Um, but uh, there may still be some technical problems in terms of whether you can actually hear us or see us, uh, but hopefully you can hear us. If you can't hear us, then I can say whatever I want, but, um, uh, but some people can. And I've used expletives on programs before, which I won't do today. So now I will ask our guest to introduce himself. So name, rank, and serial numbers. Stuart, over to you. Hi there, um, Stuart Fieldhouse, uh, director with Hawksmoor Partners in London. Um, a former journalist, um, still working in the communications field, although I've been in the market for 25 years or so. Um, and I, I advise asset managers and technology companies on their communications. Um, but I've had I've held a number of roles also within um, investment banking and forex broking as well in the course of my career. Thanks very much, Stuart. And Simon, over to you. Leave out the bit about your criminal record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we try and keep that one under under wraps, Roy. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me here today. Um, my name is Simon Moss. Uh, I'm currently Chief Marketing Officer at Track Insights, which is a data provider for the exchange traded funds market. Um, I've had about 20 years experience in um, in the institutional world, um, predominantly on the uh, on the ETF exchange and indexing side. But in the uh, earlier part of my career, I was in a for this conversation, the less transparent end of the world, which was uh, the hedge funds and the over the counter credit markets. So looking forward to the conversation today. And look, I think that both of you have some uh, really interesting and relevant experience to uh, add to that. So I'm looking forward to that. And finally, uh, John Arneson, who used to be the brains of the organization, but has decided he wants to be the beauty of the organization. Over to you. Your words, not mine. Uh, morning, everybody. John Arneson. I'm the consultancy lead for uh, PeerPoint. Uh, prior to that, I had um, about 30 years uh, running various agency lending businesses for a number of institutions. Right. Thanks, John. Um, just a quick uh, hello to Janaid. You're our first commentator today, and he's joining us from London. Great to see you in London, uh, and uh, hopefully we have a little bit more Hong Kong-like weather uh, today and you feel a little bit more at home. Uh, so thanks for joining us. Uh, look, for those of you that are joining us for the first time, and, and each week the, uh, the audience seems to be growing, uh, notwithstanding the delay today, um, uh, the, the reason my eyes dart all over the place is, first of all, I, I think I have a little bit of ADHD. The other reason is I have all kinds of controls and mechanisms and screens uh, going all over the place, so I have to produce the program as well uh, as uh, 
give you this kind of inane chatter. Um, and just to the panelists, uh, just so you know, all of the all of the video and everything and all your sound is coming good through to me. Uh, if anyone in the audience is experiencing anything diff different, uh, please give us uh, a, a note in the chat there. But look, all of this came about because, as I said, I was ranting about uh, transparency uh, and some uh, questionable moves recently by ESMA, in, in my opinion. Uh, and that uh, rant triggered a comment from Stuart. Stuart reached out on LinkedIn and, uh, and told me he could uh, write a book on uh, transparency and the uh, issues surrounding it. So, Stuart, maybe you can just give us some background to what you were thinking was and why you, why you reached out. Uh, sure. I mean, basically, it boils down to a couple of things that, that, that stem from when I was working in, in the FX broking market and we were doing uh, market making. And one of that one of those those issues stemmed from at the time when we were look, we were we had a short sterling CFD contract. I was doing some research into how um, we calculated that and how the LIBOR rate was calculated in London. And I was staggered at the time at just how few people actually controlled the LIBOR calculation rate. And I thought at the time as a former journalist, this is this is this has got to be open for abuse. And lo and behold, it was. And a huge scandal was born from it. Um, and that was that was well before there that, you know, any any big issues emerged from that that area. Um, and I was quite surprised because, you know, you get in this industry, you get educated that there's a lot of transparency out there. There's a lot of look through. We hear a lot about how, for example, funds have to report a large amount of data to investors and to the regulators. And that's always increasing. And so consequently, it creates this uh, assumption by many people in the market that, that there is a lot more transparency in in the way um, trading and investing occurs and in the way prices are calculated, um, when in reality, that's not necessarily the case. And I think you know, the LIBOR scandal was just um, one example of that. And um, you know, I'm sure there are other areas of the market which would benefit from more transparency, um, but, but it, that, that light is just not being shone there at the moment. But that, that was really, I mean, that was kind of the, the kind of the, the tip of the iceberg for me, which is which... great. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks. I think that's, that's a good framework. And, and I think LIBOR is a good example, which we can revisit of transparency without context, because that's the issue. You know, the LIBOR price is transparent. But what does it actually tell you? I guess is the point. Um, Simon, any any sort of further anything you want to add to uh, to that? Yeah, thanks, Roy. I mean, uh, yeah, I absolutely kind of agree with Stuart. And I think LIBOR was one of the high profile examples of where there was something going on that people didn't really understand under the hood. Um, it was certainly uh, well documented in the media, but. Sadly, I think it's probably not the only example of a of a benchmark being uh, being fiddled with in some in some nefarious way, and I think we've seen over the last few years the same thing happening in the precious metals market and certainly in the credit markets as well. But to Stuart's point, I'd ask a very very simple question, which I think highlights all of the challenges faced here, which is what is the price of a bond? Pick a bond. What is the price? It's an extraordinarily difficult question to answer. It should be a very straightforward question to answer. Um, but because of the structure of the markets, it's actually impossible to actually find out what the real price of a bond is until you buy it. So I think that illustrates probably that's going to kind of segue into a lot of other issues. We're going to come here today around pricing, around reporting, and around the kind of information that's actually valuable for investors and for regulators. But with the theme of transparency in mind, and, and to pick up on Stuart's point, um, I think there is this glut of uh, data. There's always a demand for more, more, more information, uh, more frequent information, more detailed information. But more isn't always better. And I think one of the things I'd like to certainly hear from, from the audience as well is that what do you do with this information once you've got it? And I think a lot of what's happening around this idea of transparency it's almost like a dog chasing a bus right the dog is the dog's excited it loves chasing that bus and it chases it every day and then what happens when it catches it 
And I think that's the same kind of situation for a lot of people when they ask for transparency is what are you going to do with it when you've got it? So I think that, that's, that would probably be my opening question. Hopefully we can kind of jump from jump from there. That's a, and that's a great question, right? Because it's always about what is what is the purpose and the end objective of of transparency. So I'm sure we'll revisit that. Uh, John, I'm wondering <laughs> if you want to add anything more from a securities finance perspective. And also, uh, I don't know if you've seen Janae's question, but he's asking um, how much of the uh, here. I'll just I'll just pop it up. Uh, how much of the industry depends on data provided by Bloomberg? So uh, I don't know if you can wrap those two things uh, together. I mean, actually, I mean, I'd like to come back to securities finance a bit later because I think it's, it, it will build as we discuss this. But um, Simon just raised a very good point. I was thinking about this yesterday in that I was, um, in terms of my own private pension, I don't, I don't care. Well, I do care, but I don't really know um, when, my fund, when my fund manager changes a portfolio or it buys or sells, I don't get to see what he does that at. And frankly, I don't think I need to. I know that he's regulated and I know that he's acting in under regulation that requires him to do certain things. So I think the point is to, to the bus analogy, um, I don't chase the bus because I don't think I have to. But am I, am I being naive, Simon? Yeah, well, I, I mean, John, I'd answer that in two ways. So in, in some ways, you, you, you're you really relying on the regulated status of that of that particular individual to give you the comfort, right? And I think what the point of transparency must be primarily is to give people comfort, right? And to give people a sense of uh, security in the sense that they've been educated and informed about what there is, what it is they're invested in or what it is they're about to invest in. And... I agree that you should be able to trust, you know, you should be able to trust the people you've got your money with. But unfortunately, I think things like the Neil Woodford scandal really illustrate that just regulatory approval isn't a, isn't a guaranteed safety net for people. So, so as an investor, and you know, everybody's got a pension fund, right? And, and I completely agree with you. How often do you spend, how much time do you actually spend figuring out what's going in or out or, or happening with that particular investment? I mean, maybe you check in once every once every couple of months or, or, or a couple of times a year. The question I would kick, kick back to you, you know, kick back to you is people can be given this information, but they do need to be able to understand what it means and also to be able to use that to challenge people. And the majority of the majority of personal investors who have a who have a, 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 a private or a, or a corporate pension fund probably just don't have the education levels to even kind of process the information they're being given, let alone challenge it, let alone kind of see if anything's going wrong. So I do have a lot of sympathy with your point of view, which is, um, I don't chase the bus because I feel I don't need to. Uh, I also have a lot of sympathy with the idea that if you if you even if you're given the transparency, what are you going to do with it? Um, uh, because if you're going to be second guessing every act every action of your fund manager or, or your pension provider, you know I think that's a very kind of deep rabbit hole to start going down. Unless, of course, um, if they were uh, required to provide me with uh, the range of the day's tradable you know, pr prices and to show where they executed, I suppose that would be some form of transparency that I don't currently have. But again, I'd read that and I'd say, yeah, it seems like he executed pretty well within the range with, with the volume that he was doing, et cetera, et cetera. But isn't that a lot of, a huge amount of onerous on them for something that I think the majority of the likes of retail investors, which I'm including myself in, don't really aren't going to really do anything with it. I mean, they're not going to report to me something that's outside of the day's range. So even if it's at the low or the high, either way, he did well or he, or he didn't do so well. But I can't challenge. I don't have the information to know what to do with that information, which didn't make sense. Right. You know I mean? It you reminds me of a point early, very earlier in, in my career when I was working more in the kind of hedge fund area. And we used to have these... Uh, interesting panel discussions really for in, for institutional investors and i won't name the individual but he was uh he was a very senior guy at a monaco private bank um he used to be in charge of hedge, hedge fund selection and his point around transparency was um you give me money uh because i have this hedge fund strategy and, and you trust me and you like the strategy um i don't need to give you the transparency because you're not going to do anything with it 
And if you think you're better at managing your money than me, then go ahead and manage your money. And so, I, so I think there's always this tension. I think, that, and and that's particularly true in the in the active space. Okay, guys, can I just? I hate doing this, right? And I hate doing this because I think you guys have just laid out something that I really don't want to talk about. But first of all, Ali Ali Kazimi from the audience has pointed out that governance and transparency is at the top of the agenda. And that's particularly true of, of regulators. And, and I have to say, the comments that you guys just made actually reinforces that. Because, John, you said that you know that your pension manager is a regulated entity. And so you kind of trust the framework around which uh, the, or within which they operate. Yeah. And, and the reality is that um, one of the one of the problems that we're talking about is transparency for the sake of transparency. Well, regulators are in a dilemma. If they don't make it onerous and detailed for the pension manager, then you can't really rely on him, can you? So, so isn't that the fundamental problem? The reason why it's at the top of the regulators' agenda, and and the reason why it's a problem, because the truth is, even if they give you that range of tr to the day's price, even if they're at the bottom. That might have been the best price available at the size and the quantity and the time when that order went in. So, so that's my point about context. Comment, guys. What, what do you think about anything I've just said? Um, sure, I think, been, yeah, well, I, I mean, basically, this, this really goes back to the whole issue of pricing. And, um, you know, are, there is a concern. Regulators are concerned about this whole pricing issue and investors are concerned because when you start talking about very large ticket sizes, the pricing makes a massive difference. Um, and we see this, for example, in the, um, the way FX um, trades are, pr are priced and how um, there is uh, slippage in, in the live FX pricing going on all the time. Now, that's not a problem, say, if you're a retail trader, going back to the retail theme where, you know, you have a, let's say you're doing a $10,000 sterling trade, you know, okay, so maybe it's going to cost you a few, you know, 20 quid here or there. Not a big deal. But if you're anyone who's moving, you know, 10 million bucks in the market, um, that lack of transparency, that lack of best execution is is a big issue. And it comes down to you know who's giving you the price is the broker giving you the best price why isn't he giving you the best price what sort of obligation is he under to give you the best price um the area is still murky um it's not it's not something you can you can point to and say yes this is a really transparent and efficient market because xyz because no one's well, very few i think there are a few market participants who might have a clear picture but there aren't many to be honest with you Simon, do you have anything? Yeah, I mean, uh, just a just a brief comment. Um, I think uh, I think kind of John hit the nail on the head when he said the word trust. Um, I think that's really what it comes down to. Um, I think a lot of the transparency, particularly from the regulators' point of view, is is about kind of um, either covering the back or wiping the mess up after it's happened, right? And doing that kind of forensic investigation when there has been a problem in the market and see whether or not they can prevent it in the future. Uh, it doesn't necessarily stop anything bad happening in the in the first instance. Um, so uh, absolutely, you know, the, the, the context there is is ex extremely key. Um, and I, I mean, I, I agree with Stuart. It's it's uh, there are particular kind of segments of the marketplace where where the opaque nature, the OTC structures kind of lend themselves uh, or, or, or kind of open the door to um, price manipulation or um, or lack of best execution, and that may be more troubling for 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 some than others. But what I would what I would really kind of like highlight there is that as an industry, as the financial services or asset management industry, I think one of the things we suffer from most of all is a total lack of trust and faith from everybody who interacts with us. Now we can we can we can argue to the cows come home about whether or not that's fair um, but i think from the majority of people's experience if you give wall street the ability to to make a buck they're going to take the buck right and i think a lot of the transparency is really around balancing this lack of trust and putting something in place where where there's accountability when when the 
what's possibly the inevitable happens. If I could, Roy, um, Simon, you mentioned earlier about, you asked the question, how do you price a bond? And I was thinking back to my days when I used to sell government, US government bonds years ago. And, you know, we use, we use brokers like Cantor and FBI and, and the, you know, the price of the long bond was within one sixteenth on every single screen. And I would say that that was the price of that bond because there was a great referenceable price in, uh, across many broker dealers. Would you say, yes, that is fair and that is absolute transparency of that. But, but equally, a credit bond is going to lack the, that, it's a lack of liquidity that leads to a, an absolute mystery of pricing. Absolutely. Liquidity and, and, and pricing are intimately um, connected. I would agree with that. And if you're trading those liquid T-bill markets, there's probably much tighter pricing and much more consensus based pricing from the different um, from the different uh, dealers. Uh, but when you get into um, maybe some parts of the kind of corporate bond or emerging market bond markets, and certainly what I used to see in the in the in the credit default swap markets was you could have a very significant range of um, uh, bids and offers out there at a particular point um, and it was very challenging for people to actually kind of you know calculate where that kind of mid midpoint was uh, at any given time and I think if, I think the point still stands I think you need to make a transaction in some markets in order to be able to find out what the price is so Simon I might I might just add to that because you, you said that there was uh, not necessarily the liquidity or pricing in some parts of the corporate bond market I would suggest that the entire market suffers to a degree of uh, of lack of transparency or lack of lack of liquidity and therefore impacting pricing as you say the two are intertwined and, and I think again part of that so it's never been a good environment right people have been trying to come up with you know, dark pools or private platforms for decades, literally. Um, uh, and none of them have really been all that transformational. Some you might argue have been successful, but not necessarily transforming the market. Um, it's interesting. I was talking about this on Clubhouse last night, actually. And, uh, and the reality is that with the regulatory change away from proprietary trading by banks, the amount of inventory they carry in corporate bonds has actually diminished. Uh, at the same time that because of interest rates, the number of bonds in issue have probably doubled at least. So you actually have a fourfold difference in liquidity in corporate bonds from before <laughs> to today. And that uh, uh, that's in a better market. Uh, I'm not convinced it is. So I don't want, I don't want to get waylaid. But but do you see transparency and liquidity as as being intimately in intertwined or just connected? Let me take the example of the exchange traded funds market, where where I've been spending most of my uh, most of my time for the last few years. Um, and let's contrast the experience that people have in North America to the one they have here in Europe. Now, in the US, you obviously have a single country, single currency, a single tax regime, um, a single language. Uh, very, very, very straightforward from that point of view. And in Europe, you've obviously got, you know, 15, 16 different countries that don't speak the same language. Most of them don't like each other very much. Uh, there's different tax systems. Um, there's different kind of product offerings. Now, we also have a, a from a transparency point of view, you think about ETF trade reporting, not to kind of bore people to tears at this time in the morning. But in the US, you have a consolidated tape. So it's very, very easy to see the kind of uh, the action on the market at any given point. But in Europe, you've got this fragmented liquidity uh, EK system. So different exchanges, different trading platforms, a large amount of OTC uh, 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 trading. And what that does is it makes the market look a lot smaller than it is. And when people do the analysis, do, uh, do let's say, liquidity analysis on a, on a European listed ETF, they find it very, very difficult to get the kind of full picture. And having spoken to a lot of investors, a lot of people in the industry for a number of years, that was seen as holding the industry back because the because people could only really see the kind of tip of the liquidity iceberg. And a lot of large institutions particularly thought they couldn't execute uh, trades efficiently because there wasn't sufficient liquidity. That was actually untrue. So I think, you know, that there's a very, very kind of 
tight relationship between those two. Um, they, may not, they, may, they may not be twins, but they're certainly in the same, uh, in the same family. Okay. All right. Thanks for that. Uh, this, I'm going to move to the uh, second topic, but, but before then, I just want to flash up Ali's question here. So um, you've got governance and transparency at the top of the agenda. I'm going to leave aside governance because we're going to talk about that maybe in a future episode. But do you think transparency should be at the top of the regulatory uh, agenda? Um, uh, Stuart, Stuart, go on. It was a deep, <laughs> it's like when your builder comes around and... Well, I, I actually, because I, I, I think the two are quite closely intertwined. I think you're right in that respect, um, because um, a lot of, if you look at a lot of the governance in, say, the asset management industry now, um, the emphasis is on, you know, if you are, let's say you're a fund director, for example, or you're in, responsible for risk management within a third party management company, a lot of the emphasis, a lot of the regulatory emphasis is on you. Um, to make sure that that you can see what's going on in the fund, or that you can see what's happening with the strategy, so so the obligation is that you should be able to um, see the act the essential activity in the portfolio, and and if you can't, um, and and you you aren't telling the regulator you can't, then then essentially you have a problem. Um, that that's something that we're seeing cropping up um, again and again. Um, I think there is an awareness on the part of regulators that more might need to be done in this area. That's not necessarily talking about fund A has to go and disclose all its positions publicly. That's just the fact that somebody else other than the manager of fund A has to be a, who's independent of that manager um, has to have some degree of or well, has to have a high degree of oversight over the assets in the portfolio and the way it's being managed. And I think that's that's something that the regulators have been banging on about for a while. Um, um, but as, as we've already mentioned in this discussion, occasionally you're still going to see um, scandals um, emerging when that isn't being done properly. Um, now, the question then is, does that require more regulation or, or, or does that um, does that still fall down on the way governance itself is being organized at the moment? Uh, interesting, interesting perspective, which uh, I think uh, I think I would actually like to come back to on another program because I think you've touched on some great points there. Um, Simon, uh, anything that you want to add? And before you do that, one of the things that while you were talking, it reminded me, are you part of the transparency uh, uh, task force? Uh, yes, I, uh, I am right. Thank you. As, as am I. And it just struck me a lot of what you were talking about. That's why I rung the bell. So one of your fundamental or one of the fundamental beliefs is that unless people trust the market, there is not going to be a market, right? Or the market will be limited. Yeah, well, I think I think there's I think it's, it's managed trust, isn't it? I, I, you know, I think I think if you've got a particularly kind of aggressive guard dog, um, you, you trust it to a certain point that you don't um, you don't provoke it. And I, I get the feeling that many people kind of consider the financial markets in the in the same light that uh, we're only going to trust them up to a point. But we do need the shock collar, and we do need the uh, and we do need the stick in case they get out of hand. And I think, and and, and to, to me, that's the, one of the fundamental kind of the functions of, of regulators. It doesn't necessarily stop things happening, but it does create accountability on the on the back end if uh, if there are different shenanigans going on. Uh, and John, maybe last word to you on this before we move on. Well, I was gonna, I, actually, I was, just to swerve slightly away from that, we, we didn't really answer the question um, about how much does the industry um, rely on, on Bloomberg data. And I, from my experience, I've never, I've never used any other pricing service for everything I've ever, ever had to price than Bloomberg. And I always rely on the fact that most prices are about 54 reference points from various banks, but I think the question is a good one in that uh, why do we why do we trust Bloomberg's pricing? And in fact, I used to have arguments with with broker dealers to say, you know, my price is X. Well, I'm not using Bloomberg. I'm using this. Well, sod you. We're using Bloomberg pricing. And by the way, that's my pricing to re to revalue the um, the outstanding book, etc. So we've we've all agreed collectively, I think, and Simon and Stuart can tell me if I'm wrong that. 
that Bloomberg has become the de facto pricing source for almost everything financial that, that outside of commodities, maybe. Is that, would you say that's fair? Um, yeah, I think the majority of people probably probably rely on that. Um, I do think I do think Johnny makes a point about information asymmetry because obviously the average person doesn't have a Bloomberg terminal, but uh, I would agree that professionals probably would typically use that. Yeah, and, and, and agree with it as well. I mean, the two parties agree to use a pricing service that must be relatively um, satisfactory. Stuart, anything to add before we move on? Yeah, yeah, I was going to say that that is the case in 99% of markets. Um, as as John mentions, there are some markets where um, I'm, that I'm aware of where um, the price is not coming off Bloomberg. Um, for example, as he mentioned, some of the, the metals markets are being calculated um, more informally than you would believe, actually. <laughs> um, I, I know of... Um, yeah, some markets are still being calculated by journalists ringing round um, four or five dealers and then publishing a price that sits somewhere in the middle of them. Um, now that may then go on Bloomberg subsequently, um, but but you know I know people who are daily responsible um, for fixing a price in a specific metal market based off half a dozen phone calls. Um, Actually, it's interesting you say that, Stuart, because I just thought about the fact that when we used to lend securities, if I didn't have a price on Bloomberg or the price was older than five days, I didn't lend it because I had no idea of liquidity. It gave, to me, it was a liquidity signal that if you lend this thing, you're never going to get it back if you need to. So in that sense, I use a lack of price to, to inform me. Yeah, uh, guys, great, a great point. The only thing I'd add on the end is that right now, probably in just about every firm, uh, where there are stale prices or missing prices, that's exactly how they how they fill them in, right? They, they, they'll actually do a, a ring around to a number and, and pop it in. But obviously, data pricing is a, a much better than it used to be. And the final point on Bloomberg, you know, that dominance is despite the fact that I know my own personal experience, the last two banks that I worked at spent quite a lot of time and effort to get off of Bloomberg. Uh, and we managed to get carve outs for securities lending because so much of the market used it. Um, so you're talking about dominance despite despite uh, people's efforts. So, um, right. So I want to move on to the next topic, but just a, a quick note there. If you're enjoying this show, if you like what we actually bring to you uh, and you think these panelists are as great as I think they are, then please give us a thumbs up or a like um, because that helps us be seen by other people and these they can share their views with, with them. So I want to move on to the second point now. And, and Simon, I'm going to ask you to lead this up because we talked about transparency uh, and we I, I've really focused more on the regulatory side of transparency. But there is another angle to, the, to it, isn't there? Yeah, there is. And um, it's uh, it, I, think, I think this speaks very well to the kind of markets um, that I'm currently in. Um, I mean, transparency is also about, you know, when you you know, going back to John's point about his pension fund and my earlier point about Neil Woodford is that it's there is a value in understanding what you what you own, even if you don't do anything about that, right? Even if you don't action that information. The, the knowledge is uh, knowledge is valuable for its own sake. And the the ETF market obviously has been around for a long time. It's been around for about 20, 25 years here in Europe, for example. And the industry always, you know, one of its early selling points was to contrast ETFs against um, active mutual funds and go, look, we're transparent. You can see all of our holdings. We publish this daily. Um, you understand the weights. And we're not one of these managers with a secret source where you see our top 10 positions and, and that's all we managed to show you. Um, so for a long time, the ETF markets really tried to sell themselves and the fact that they were indexed and very transparent both from the holdings point of view but also from the um kind of portfolio management you know the rules-based kind of aspect of that <coughs> but excuse me but that proved not to be a very strong selling point over over time um and one of the things we do here at track insight is um research uh with, uh, with institutional buyers um we 
currently poll about let's say five percent of the whole ETF market globally so relatively good representation and when we talk to them about what they value in ETFs transparency is nowhere near top of the list um, and in fact transparency comes after cost diversification and the tradability of the products Stop. so this idea that I, people can, are, I, can I just interrupt you there do you want yeah. to jump to uh, now you've kindly prepared some slides which we don't normally do, but uh, do you want me to flash some of these up for you? Uh, yeah, if you if you can, uh, Roy, that'd be fantastic. Yeah. Well, I, I I'm going to try. I don't know if I can, but I will try. Uh, we, we'll we'll <laughs> share them afterwards if people uh, if people um, would like to see them. They're welcome to contact me or, or Roy. Um, so so the idea that investors value kind of uh, transparency is possibly overemphasized by people, and and maybe various reasons for that. The other thing I would kind of highlight, and this idea that maybe transparency is becoming overvalued, is the growth of the active ETF market, which has been extremely significant in the last particularly couple of years. And you're seeing kind of superstar managers like Kathy Wood at ARC kind of really kind of, you know, getting, getting big headlines and, and getting kind of huge media exposure. But to me, this is fascinating because what we've seen is a market evolving, one which really focused on being rules based, transparent and indexed. And that had a lot of success. But we're seeing a huge acceleration now with this with these new active strategies, some of which are not transparent. And the SEC, uh, just towards the end of last year, allowed for the very first time non transparent ETFs to be listed. So a huge, huge kind of turnaround uh, point for the industry. But what the flows have seen and what the growth of the assets have seen, I think that's slide four, Roy, if you want to bring that one up. This is, um, this is data. So the purple line here shows the AUM growth. And uh, active ETFs have just been, you know, absolutely on a tear over $300 billion of assets now. But if you look at the monthly flows, again, they're tremendous. Only one negative month in the last kind of five years. So what this tells me is that people are buying active ETFs, despite the fact they're less transparent or potentially less transparent than other tra other um, other products out there. So to me, that's very interesting because it shows to kind of to many of the points that were raised on uh, by 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 the other speakers that transparency is valuable at a certain point, and um, potentially at this at least in the ETF markets, people are saying. I'm happy with a lower degree of transparency if I can find a great strategy or if I can find diversification or perhaps if I can flip out um, a mutual fund exposure into a, into a lower cost ETF exposure. So I think transparency is one thing that investors do focus on, but it's possibly not even in the top three. Yeah, so do you want to go to your survey that you did? Uh, yeah, if you just want to bring that, just flash that up very quickly, and I'll just I'll just talk through that. So, for the audience, we um, we went out and polled about uh, 370 investors, um, uh, you know, ma managing somewhere in the region of kind of 400 billion dollars, and these were their kind of these were their kind of answers. This is why people look at ETFs. Now, you could see ETFs as almost a paradigm, as I said, a paradigm of transparency compared to the mutual fund market compared to the structured products market for sure. Um, but that's, this isn't the reason why people are buying them. So uh, that was the really the point I was trying to make. It's, it's an additional feature. It's a valuable feature, but it's potentially not the primary thing that people look for um, when they at least trade ETFs. Right. OK, listen, thank, thanks for that. Um, I think, uh, John, uh, it's, uh, Stuart, any, any comments on there? Is anything there surprise you? Um, from my perspective, no. Um, I think, you know, at the, at the end of the day, certainly with the ETFs, my impression was always that it was the, uh, primarily it was the cost, the fact that they, that they are, that they're cheap and that they can be easily, easily traded. They've been the big, the big selling point. Um, I think the transparency issue has been partly driven by regulatory requirements as well um we'll keep going back to that but um it does it does i think one of the big questions for me is going to be is are the regulators really asking for more for more transparency than even investors um 
really feel is necessary is, is are we, are we get, just getting into that culture where too much is being asked for than is required for the you know the guy who's actually pushing pulling the trigger on on a particular investment and as a, a lot of the other information can just possibly be pulled in in um some kind of a some private ring fence data area for regulators to consult as and when they feel it's necessary Thanks. yeah i'll just jump on that Stuart, if i may because um the uh what you, one of the one of the things you get with an etf is something called a pcf file which is the portfolio calculation file now anyone anyone who's listening to this webinar can call an etf issuer up and get a pcf file they're, they're available to everybody free of charge and uh, some of them some of them are available on the websites some of them you have to email or give them a phone call but this gives you the precise breakdown of what that product owns um, exactly how much of each um, each security it has. Um, it's about as transparent as you're going to get. And I think in, you know, 15 plus years working in the ETF, I've rarely been asked for a PCF file by anyone, by, by an investor or a regulator. And I promise you this, if we sent it to them, they don't ask twice. So just to be clear, Simon, um, these less than transparent ETFs is because they don't want to disclose the strategy to the masses. Because yeah, that's, that's exactly correct. Yeah. So obviously with the active space, you know, there's this idea that I might get front run or I might have my kind of value eroded right. if I have almost, if I have close to real time transparency or if I have even daily transparency. And so active non-transparent ETFs, they, they do vary in the, in the way that they report. Ultimately, they can either disclose uh, partially or they can disclose on a delayed basis, which um, gives them that kind of uh, sense of security that they, they're not going to get um, uh, killed by the rest of the market. Um, so even with that um, less transparent um, portion of the portion of the ETF business, there is still a degree of transparency. It's potentially just not as high frequency as uh, with some of the other products. But again, I would caution the audience that they do that, that does vary from from fund to fund. So it's worth having a worth, worth having a look. Yeah, yeah um, I mean, in some ways, it's quite completely reasonable for products not to be completely disclosed. I mean, for example, um, you know, Apple didn't disclose what they were doing before they built the iPhone. <laughs> they didn't share it with their competitors. Um, so when we ask for a transparency, it has to be for, it can't be that you're giving away competitive advantage in doing so, which is exactly applicable to these ETFs, right? Absolutely. And you no, know, I think one of the great things is that what it's done is encouraged active managers to be part of the ETF markets, whereas previously they weren't because, right. um, because of this, this, uh, this problem that they, that they had, right? There's no point having that expertise and, 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 uh, all of that experience just to have it eroded away because of this excessive transparency, right? So it's actually a very, very interesting point because it needs to work for all participants in the market, right? And while we don't want people to abuse their positions or, or play dirty tricks or, 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 or screw their clients over in any way, we also don't want to prevent innovation happening and we don't want to kind of close the doors on people. Um, so there certainly is that kind of balance to, to be struck. Okay. Right. So, guys, listen, uh, we're at 11 o'clock, which is when we would normally be cutting off. We, we started late. Uh, so my apologies to everyone for that, because uh, that looks like all the technical problems were on my end, which is why I should fire me as producer. But, uh, you know, it's hard to get help. Um, but uh, it, I don't know what your timing is like, guys, whether you can carry on with us uh, or, or not. Uh, but I'd uh, I'd like to move on to point three, and maybe John, you kind of talked about it earlier when you talked about sort of uh, pricing points and and benchmarking and all of that. So, so without transparency, without the kind of transparency that we have, and and without sort of proper governance, can you even can you even assess performance or benchmarking or like how do you how do you determine where you are in the spectrum without it? So isn't it by definition necessary? I mean, I think it's fair to say that um, there has to be disclosure of what you've done. Um, and what I mean by that is, if I use securities finance as our, you know, the point, the thing that we are very familiar with, Roy, is that, you know, we report to clients exactly where they are. We always talk about securities lending being completely transparent to the client. And actually, I think we need a different word because 
the more I read about what regulators are thinking about, transparency in itself isn't isn't regulated. It's, it's, a, it's the outcome of something, but there is no regulation specific about transparency. But, um, but you know, you, we reported to clients all of our activity, um, where the mark to market was, what we lent it at, the fees, et cetera. But they didn't have any reference point to was that good, bad, or indifferent. You could argue, because there are data providers um, out there, service providers that, that benchmark the data, although it's a very loaded word benchmark, but it's at least an aggregated fee of all the activity in that particular security. So you can argue that you could use that as a reference point. I would then counter argue that I had, I've had i lent huge amounts of securities in my time, way over or under that, that benchmarking data for very, very good reason, which, I, which I'm not going to disclose now. But, it, but suffice it to say that there was a transaction that made it so. And therefore, it kind of renders the that the point about using a benchmark somewhat diluted, but it's but it, at least it's a starting point because without it, given that this is a very OTP market, in theory the use of Equilens um, uh, NGT platform is making that more of a um, a, a tradable sort of uh, um, area ETF in which to use. But I think there's probably I think there's probably enough enough data if you are interested to determine whether your provider is 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 being what ultimately is the goal which is to provide you best execution now best execution itself is problematic because it's actually very it's very loosely worded in my opinion i mean it it basically lets you off the hook to some extent because it doesn't say you will do the following it says you have to consider a number of events in order to treat the client and, uh, fairly and, and execute at the best possible uh, for the best possible outcome. That's probably because regulators would have a very hard time um, count, uh, you know, cr criticizing your activity because unless they absolutely replicated the environment at the time, they wouldn't know either. So I think I think there's probably some work to be done on that. But personally, I don't think that um, I don't think there's a lack of transparency. I think there's a lack of uh, why you did something, not what you did, if that makes sense. Well, it does to me. That's what I keep describing as context, right? Right. So as you, you, you did a trade over the market price, below the market price, and there was a reason why, and just the number is just a starting point. It's not the full explanation. But the thing is, when you do that, that ends up going into the data, which then um, dilutes the aggregated fee for that particular security, because I'm part of that. So... If everyone's doing the same, do you really have a referenceable um, fee? Right. So that's a good point. So, guys, um, from other market experiences, any any sort of thoughts on on analogies or, or questions that raises? I tell you one thing. I found out, Roy, is that the FCA made a very interesting point um, that I read. In that they they find that the consumer side, the consumers, are always pushing the FCA to disclose more about bad actors and um, they want to name and shame, um, you know, those that are, are, are found to be lacking. The FCA's response to that is that at times they cannot do that for legal reasons because those, even those bad actors are, you know, they, they are protected by law to some extent. Um, and, and they also made followed on to say that if they created an atmosphere where everything was named and shamed and it was completely transparent, everyone would close ranks and not be as cooperative so there is a, a fine, there's a balance between um, knowing that you're operating in a market in, professionally, but if, you're, if you feel you're going to be criticized at every single point, you may not do that. And I think that's fair to say of people in general, that if you feel that you're being, everything you do is so transparent, where's the individual flair or entrepreneurialism, et cetera? So there's a, there's a risk here that we take it too far. Uh, I would actually want to I'll follow up on that, actually, John. Um, I'll get, uh, there's a good example in that the activity we've been seeing in the market recently um, where uh, U.S. hedge funds and other market participants have to disclose their short positions once they go over a certain level um, in that particular company. Now, this is a case of trans regulatory obliged transparency in action. But what it also has now done is it's set up a situation where um, 
the sort of Reddit traders can now see where hedge funds have built up particularly large uh, short positions in a stock and they can try and initiate a short squeeze against that against that particular fund. It's been creating a lot of problems for funds, but it's also ended up in some incredibly um, uh, unrealistic pricing situations uh, in the market. And the thing I found interesting was um, Pearson shares were um, a target for this in, so I think it was January. Um, there was quite a substantial short interest um, on Pearson stock. Uh, I went back and checked um, a few weeks later, and that short interest, the part of the disclosed UK short interest um, in Pearson had virtually vanished. And I think what's happened is hedge fund managers are beginning to wake up to this threat, and their response has become, okay, um, anytime we stick our heads over the parapet, we're running the risk that we could get targeted on a particular position. Um, let's therefore just have this as, a, as some kind of a benchmark where you know, if we're going to, we have to be aware of this additional risk, and therefore a lot of short positions are being kept underneath the the public disclosure ceiling. Right now, before anyone comments on that, I'm going to stop you because Stuart, that is a show that I want to do on its own. So, so I'll invite you back on that. But the essence of the blog post was, in fact, that I think uh, that kind of short selling disclosure regulation is the perfect air cover for frauds to set up their companies in Europe because hedge fund managers are less likely to go after them in Europe than they are elsewhere. And to me, that's regulators enabling fraudsters. And that's a topic worth discussing. And I'm sure people would disagree. And that's what I want. So listen, uh, we've uh, we started late. We're we're finishing late. So maybe uh, maybe what we can do is just do a quick roundup. Final words, final thoughts from from each of you. Um, uh, Stuart, we just heard from you. So maybe Simon, last one. Oh, you're on mute. Muted. Uh, yeah. Well, look. First of all, thanks for a very interesting conversation. I think we're, we're really just scratching the surface of. You know, for the audience and for the listeners, I think you know, depending on which part of the market in, you're going to have a different requirement for transparency. You're going to have a different definition, and you're going to have a different expectation of of what that is going to deliver for you. Um, so, I think when we talk about this, we're talking very philosophically. We're talking, we're covering a lot of different um, angles. But I think the key takeaway for me for this conversation is that transparency transparency needs to be actionable. And if we're doing it for its own sake, um, we have to really kind of question why why we're spending so much time, money, and energy producing it. And if it's uh, if it's not actionable, then then what's the point? So I think if you if you've got to be able to do something with it, far be it for me to suggest that politicians uh, want to be shown to be doing something. So transparency is always a great thing to call for and push for. Um, but again, I think that's. We could never believe they would act so uh, cynically. No, probably not. So Simon, Simon from Track Insight, thanks very much. The uh, uh, the uh, slideshow, as you said, will be it'll either be uh, in LinkedIn or you can you'll be able to find it on uh, on our YouTube channel, um, which I'll flash up before I finish. So thank thanks for doing that, uh, Stuart. Um, final thoughts from you. Yeah, I mean, my final thought is really on benchmarking. Um, you know, not all benchmarks are created equal. Um, if you're using a benchmark, um, uh, find out how it's calculated. Um, I was shocked when I found out how LIBOR was calculated, to be honest with you. Um, uh, so if you're using a benchmark, um, you know, take a closer look at who it is who's calculating the benchmark. Um, and and um, how that price is being created, because I think that that's, although there's a lot of talk about benchmarking, um, the benchmark itself may deserve further scrutiny. Okay, thanks for that. And uh, a great point to finish on. And uh, John, over to you. Uh, I mean, I'd say that, I mean, it's a very interesting discussion. I was very um, interested in the slides, Simon. Um, that you know, it was transparency wasn't a driving, wasn't the leading um, reason to invest in those ETFs. 
Look, I mean, transparency is all around us. I mean, you know, we live in a country here that is relatively transparent, the Freedom of Information Act. If you're in the US, you have more access to that. And, you know, governments that are transparent usually do fairly well. I'd rather live here and uh, here than, than Myanmar, for example. So I think transparency is, it, it does what it says on the tin. I mean, the more transparent a company is about its products, the more you have a consumer loyalty. And, and the opposite is true. But if you don't trust a company, you just, you, you reject, reject what they're offering. So Simon's point about it has to be actionable is the key. I don't, I don't need to see everything, but I need, I need to know that I can if I ask for it, um, which I think is really what we should come down to. So no company can operate, no listed company can operate without full disclosure of what it's up to. Um, and that has to be a good thing. But you cannot take this thing that I've got to explain myself every minute of the day either, because nobody needs to know that. And unless it's actually, unless it's unearthing something that is is particularly a bad outcome, which I don't think it would be, um, we you could overcook this thing, and it might actually lead to some unforeseen consequences. All right. Thanks, John. Uh, so now I will tell you that this uh, show is not sponsored by Coca Cola even though given the amount that I drink, it should be. Uh, in fact, what you'll find is that uh, Pierpoint and the Pierpoint Alpha community are the sponsors of this program. Uh, we've got uh, four days left. Pierpoint Alpha community is our uh, membership club where we provide tutorials, premium editorial content that's exclusively available for members and a community forum. And we're test marketing uh, or, or testing out um, uh, virtual networking events at the moment. So uh, lots in there. We're actually closing the doors to membership in four days. So if you're interested in finding out more, uh, just drop uh, me or John a line uh, or visit the website. There's something about it on there. So I want to thank uh, all of the uh, all of the panelists who put up with all of my grief along the way uh, and the technical problems. I want to thank viewers, especially for anyone that actually put up with it. I don't want to thank Alexa, who's talking in the background, so apologies for that. Um, and that's it. See you next. Uh, we'll see you Saturday at 1 o'clock BST for our Fundamentals of Security Sending free uh, um, uh, channel series. Uh, and see you next Wednesday at 10 o'clock uh, BST for next week's show. So thanks and over and out. <laughs>